Hello, I'm Grant Bartley. In this video I want to talk about our most pressing concern, which is to reorganise the global economy into ecological sustainability. What might a global green economy look like? Here I want to examine some principles this might involve, and what these principles immediately imply. This scant sketch is meant to show both a method of developing a good global economics and an ideal of what society might look like. The first conceptual distinction to make here is that economically speaking, effectiveness means maximising the provision of goods and services, whereas efficiency means minimising resource use and waste. A pertinent principle emerging from this distinction is, when resources are plentiful, use an effective system of resource use and delivery. When resources are scarce, use an efficient system of resource use and delivery. The free market is an effective means of producing and distributing goods, meaning that it's very good at facilitating the production and distribution of the things necessary for life but it's not efficient in its use of resources to do so. There's a lot of waste. The motive in the market is profit, not sustainability. However, to create a stable global society, we need to create an efficient global economy because we need to develop an economic process which can remain at relatively low resource use. In other words, we need to change the core ideal of the global economy from one of maximising the production of goods and services to one of minimising our resource use. Now the first ideal of any good society is the provision of the basic needs for all members of that society. Another deal-breaking social ideal is to maximise a person's freedom to determine their own thought and life. Putting an ecological spin on these two principles, the basic ideal for a sustainable global society is the provision of the basic needs of all in an ecologically stable way while maximising people's freedom to determine their own thought and life. This formula recognises provision and freedom as the twin foundational principles of society in an ecological context. So let me outline a model for an environmentally stable economy, both freedom promoting and an efficient way of supplying primary needs. The environmentally friendly model I'm recommending I call a two system economy. It also has significant similarities to what is called a mixed economy. The dual economy is meant as an antidote to our present free market overstimulus to resource overuse through the pursuit of profit. As the name suggests, the most prominent characteristic of a two system economy is that it involves two economic systems. However, instead of being in conflict, these economic systems work alongside each other, even complementing each other. These two systems are the market system and the social system. I also call a social economy a provision economy. Social economic activity is distinct from market economic activity. These two systems could even work independently. Yet on this model they're interacting, even entwined with each other. By which I mean they're part of the same society. Only working together can these economic systems yield ecologically stable provision and freedom, I think. How is a two-system economy supposed to work to meet the needs of a global society in an ecologically stable way, in principle? The two systems have different functions to fulfil. The market system exists for free enterprise and the social system exists to free us from free enterprise's side effect of excess production 
necessitated by the material desperation of those who need to join just in order to eat. If people are not freed from the fear of not getting what they need to survive, they'll still do whatever they can to free themselves from that fear. The first aspect of the dual economy is the familiar free market economy, or at least its evolved future equivalent whose ideal is to pursue profit or wealth. However, the ideal for the social economy is for all people to have access to the necessities of life as a right. The idea behind this is that when the necessities are provided for people as their right, they will be liberated from the survival fears that force them into whatever available profiteering niche free market economics offers them, even the production of useless junk. People will be free to contribute to society in ways suited to their skills, desires and training. By the necessities of life, I mean first food, shelter, clothing, security and basic medical care. Then, as the social economy develops, education, more advanced medical care and whatever else necessary for life to have enough quality to be desirable. This ideal may be familiar to you in the guise of the idea of universal basic income, the idea that as a right everybody should be given enough money to live on. Universal basic income is perhaps the most obvious way to fulfil the social idea that the necessities of life are a right for all, though it's not the only plausible way. Furthermore, a social economy needs to consider not only how the means for life are distributed through society, as the universal basic income idea does, but also how the means for life are produced. The purpose and so goal of the social economy is to create goods and services to fulfil basic needs while minimising resource use, with the aim of cutting the market's resource overuse by providing for people's needs efficiently. In a market economy, the more economic output there is, the more profit there is. So immediately with free market economics there is pressure for economic growth and with it, unnecessary resource use. The aim of the social system is to ensure that people no longer must channel their needs for survival into the overproduction of goods and services, which implies the unnecessary use of resources. As significant social provision starts being achieved, people will start to be freed from the need to create profit by any means possible, and so be freed from unnecessary resource use. This is why the social economy is not a profit-oriented economy, it's a basic provision-oriented economy. The social economy would exist to produce and distribute goods and services for the needs of those who have not worked for it, as well as for those who have. This aspect will strike some, especially market enthusiasts, as too much like charity. But the provisional ideal of the social economy is not about charity, it's about enlightened self-interest. Unless a social system freely provides, it will not create a buffer to the free market's expansionist resource overuse impulse. Byzantine sanctions upheld by Byzantine bureaucracies will develop to discourage abuses of the social system, just as occurs in contemporary welfare states. The simplest way to achieve ecological stability might be for governments to limit industrial output through legislation. However, this would mean we're no longer talking about a free market, but a controlled economy, albeit a somewhat capitalistic one. I don't recommend this simple market control route. To be any good, 
any new economy we work our way to constructing must not suffer the control problems that historically have been produced through the centralization of control and or the monopolization of the economic power. As is demonstrated by all the many tyrannies of both history and current affairs. On its own, it seems to contradict the freedom aspect of our ideals, not least because it threatens totalitarianism. If not totalitarianism, then at least authoritarianism has proved to be a virtually irresistible temptation for most commanders of most command economies. This is a basic factor in what went wrong with all the communist regimes that have been tried, for example. In practice, this means that there must be freedom for personal economic action. On our two-system model, the market system is what guarantees this freedom. Indeed, I think a free market is a necessary counterbalance to the totalitarian tendencies of any command economy. If only for this reason, the free market must be preserved in any ecological revolution, by legal statute if necessary. In fact, to have a global economy without a free market aspect would be as disastrous as it's proving to be having a global market economy without some economic aspect slowing the market's expansion down. So let me be clear that the social economy is not conceived as replacing the market economy, but as running alongside it in order to put the brakes on its excesses without limiting the market's own freedom. A good economy must make allowance for the free production and distribution of goods, including artworks and other luxuries. But a healthy social system will also be opposed to the pathologies of a consumerist mentality. The dual economy will not prove an exception to the instinct people have for forming status hierarchies, however egalitarian society might otherwise become. The struggle to be alpha and the politics involved are a given for mammals such as us. But I think the most intelligent way to deal with our inescapable animal sexually selective impulses for status is to first determine what sort of economic arrangements we want, then let the status process rearrange itself around those ideals. This is in contrast to our free market economic process, which is a random reaction to status needs. And also in contrast to a process whose dogma destructively pretends that social hierarchies don't exist. For example, extreme communist egalitarianism. The point I'm making is that the human competitions for status should not be ignored or denied, but rather that the unavoidable dramas of life are best enacted in an optimally beneficial and ever-improving environment. I'm not interested in influencing or adjusting the market. The market system, I suppose, will evolve in whatever unforeseeable way. But the social economy is an independently functioning economy. The goal of the social system is to increasingly produce and distribute the resources necessary to achieve full basic provision, aiming to eventually become completely self-sufficient in doing so. In practice, this means state or parastate organisations producing and distributing what necessities they can in enlightened competition with the free market sector. Under sustainability constraints, the social economy would work to provide these things in the most resource efficient way. From the start, dedicating part of its output to benefiting the wider world, not just those producing and distributing its goods and services. This economic system exists to free those caught under the economy's wheel. 10% of productivity or economic capacity would be an appropriate standing minimum to divert those outside the system. Although the more the process can extend benefit, the healthier it is, generally speaking. The measure of a provision economy's success may indeed be the extent to which it can provide to others and also, necessarily, to itself. To begin with, a social economy must be funded by the market, 
because to begin with, there's no other source for resources. So if we're talking a state-run social economy, for example, we're talking taxes. The social economy must itself at first expand its productivity until it's big enough to fulfill its mandate of making basic provisions available for all. But the leaders of the social economy must remember that it's aiming for efficiency. The waste which has been characteristic of socialist economies should be absolutely striven against in our social economy since the efficient use of resources is this system's main raison d'etre. As the social economy increasingly produces what it needs for itself as well as for others, it will increasingly break away from reliance on the market economy. The size of the free market's labour force will shrink as labourers begin to be freed from being forced to contribute to it. Often their labour will be transferred into the full provision economy. But the market could never disappear, since there will always be many who will want to gain materially from life far beyond a subsistence level, in wealth display for instance. But two system economics is about providing an alternative to economic overproductivity, not about wiping out people's economic independence. But I think that as people are freed from the requirement to overuse resources, the market economy will increasingly sell the goods and services people actually want to create or do, even when they're not forced to do so by pure material needs. The market's labour force would have the opportunity to sell to the market according to their desires rather than through the coercion of their pure survival needs. Thus, in a well-functioning two-system economy, the market side of the economy would be a truly free market. This would itself be a very economically efficient outcome. This model is designed to work against the enslavement to materials which fuels our expansionist free market economy. I also think it's how we might fulfill the human rights we often claim people to have. It will also mean a society where people are freed from fear for their basic needs, which would be great for social psychological health. In contrast to the principles at work in our present psychologically toxic culture, where for profit the media constantly pumps materialism into our minds. I want to add finally that there must be room for the refinement of these ideas and ideals. In my next video, I'll suggest some practical ideas for implementing a global two-system economy.